In the idyllic summer of 1968, the Robeson family embarked on a much-anticipated journey from their Detroit home in Athrop Village to their cherished holiday cabin in the serene community of Good Heart, nestled next to picturesque Lake, Michigan. The Robesons, a family of six, were prepared to savor an entire season in this rustic haven, eagerly anticipating the bountiful activities that summer had to offer. At the helm of this close-knit family was 42-year-old Richard Robeson, a successful advertising executive who also held ownership of the Impresario magazine. His 40-year-old wife, Shirley, devoted herself to the role of a housewife, overseeing the household and nurturing their four children. Their children consisted of Susan, an eight-year-old bundle of energy, Randy, a 12-year-old with an insatiable sense of curiosity, Gary, the 16-year-old family dynamo, and Richie, the 19-year-old on the cusp of adulthood, the children had been fortunate enough to enjoy the gift of a stable and nurturing upbringing, with summers spent at the family's cabin becoming a cherished tradition, enriching their lives with unforgettable memories. However, as the summer of 1968 unfolded, the Robeson family's story would take a shocking and tragic turn. Richard and Shirley Robinson, along with their four beloved children, met a gruesome and inexplicable fate within the confines of their remote cabin. What should have been a season of family bonding and respite transformed into a harrowing tale of terror. The extent of the horror that unfolded on that fateful night remained hidden from the world for an agonizing month as the decaying remains of this handsome family from Lathrop village lay undiscovered. It was only when a concerned caretaker ventured to the cabin, responding to the distressing complaints of a noxious stench that the nation was thrust into the grip of an unsettling mystery. The horrific tableau of death that awaited the caretaker's arrival not only sent shockwaves through the community, but also triggered what the state police would later label as the most exhaustive investigation in their storied history. The Robeson family murders had begun, captivating the collective imagination and evoking questions that would remain unanswered for decades to come. Join us as we delve deep into this chilling and perplexing case, exploring the secrets of the Robeson family's summer tragedy. This is the haunting story of the Robeson family murders. A decade prior to the tragic events of 1968, Richard Robeson had acquired a splendid, tree-shaded cabin in the secluded and picturesque enclave of Good Heart, an area known for its rugged isolation and magnificent hardwood forests that dramatically extended to the bluffs overlooking Lake Michigan. Nestled beneath the scenic shoreline road, this hidden gem remained obscured from casual passersby, with million-dollar lodges discreetly dotting the landscape. This exclusive summer haven has over the years, garnered favor among the wealthy and reclusive as lakefront property prices soared to an astonishing $2,400 per foot. On June 6, 1968, the Robeson family began their journey to Good Heart. The Robeson family's cabin, while not completely secluded, had both neighbors and a dedicated caretaker named Chauncey Bliss, who was responsible for the cabin's upkeep. Notably, Bliss himself had constructed these cabins in 1956 and continued to be on site to ensure their maintenance. On June 24, 1968, Richard paid a visit to Bliss's residence to offer his condolences following the tragic loss of Bliss's son in a motorcycle accident. During this visit, Richard informed Bliss that the family was planning to be away for a few weeks to visit Kentucky and Florida in search of property. A note discovered later on the front door of the Robinson cabin affirmed that the family wouldn't be back until July. On the fateful morning of June 25th, a Tuesday, Richard Robeson initiated a sequence of phone calls from their cabin. He reached out to the National Bank of Detroit, inquiring about a substantial $200,000 deposit. Regrettably, no such deposit had materialized. Subsequently, he contacted his office, managed in his absence by employee Joseph Scalaro. The precise events that unfolded next remain shrouded in mystery. However, what is known is that Richard informed several neighbors of their intention to depart for Kentucky and Florida with his family that day. 
As the evening unfolded, a couple residing approximately a quarter mile, 0.4 kilometer, away reported hearing the disconcerting sounds of gunfire intermingled with raised voices belonging to two men and a woman emanating from the vicinity of the cottage. Recalling the disturbing sequence of events, the woman vividly described, we just heard a series of shots, one with a little short pause and then three or four others after that. It was still light out, so we thought that somebody was shooting gulls on the beach. In the ensuing days, life at the resort carried on as usual. However, on July 22, a group of women had assembled in a nearby cabin for a bridge party when they collectively began to detect an unpleasant and foul odor. Believing that this unsettling smell was emanating from the nearby cabin occupied by the Robeson family, they promptly contacted Bliss. Considering the Robeson family's prior disclosure of their upcoming trip and the fact that they had not been seen for several weeks, their absence initially raised no alarms. In an effort to identify the source of the malodorous scent, Bliss speculated that it might be attributed to a deceased raccoon in a crawl space. As he drew nearer, Bliss remembered observing distinct bullet holes in the windows. Preparing himself for the anticipated intensity of the smell inside the cabin, he proceeded to knock on the front door. Receiving no response, he eventually made the decision to enter the house. Upon entering, he was confronted with a woman's body splayed at the entrance, her attire in disarray, obscured beneath a blanket. Beyond her, several lifeless forms lay on the ground, surrounded by coagulated pools of blood. In the hallway, three additional corpses were sprawled, while two more were uncovered in one of the bedrooms. Overwhelmed by the horrifying scene, he swiftly retreated and alerted the authorities. This grim discovery took place on July 22, 1968, a full 27 days following the family's tragic demise. Bliss would later recall his initial approach to the cabin, where he discovered the curtains were tightly shut. The front door was securely fastened with the latch positioned from within, while a side entrance was likewise locked this time secured with a padlock. When authorities responded to the distress call at the Robeson family residence, they encountered locked doors, requiring the use of the caretaker's keys to gain entry. The home revealed the grim discovery of six bodies in separate rooms within the cabin, accounting for every Robeson family member. The shattered front window hinted at initial gunshots from outside, before the assailant entered to complete the violent act. Bullet holes were also found in a window leading into the cabin's living room. The assault seemingly began with a fusillade of five gunshots directed at Richard through a rear window, fired from a 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle. Subsequently, the assailant gained entry to the cabin through an unlocked door, proceeding to take the lives of the other five individuals using a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Susan and Richard were also subjected to brutal bludgeoning employing a hammer discovered at the crime scene. The other family members, Shirley and his sons Richie, Gary and Randy, had all fallen victim to gunfire with no hammer-related injuries. The enigmatic aspect of the case became even more pronounced with the revelation of just one partially packed suitcase, an oddity given the family's earlier intentions to travel. The house was notably well supplied with food, and the presence of playing cards left on the table suggested that the family had no anticipation of the tragic events that ultimately transpired. Investigators leaned towards the theory of a single perpetrator being responsible for the murders, chiefly based on the existence of blood-stained footprints on the floor. After a thorough examination, pathologists identified the bodies and determined that the Robeson family met their untimely end around four weeks before their discovery pinpointing the date of the murders as June 25, 1968. The prolonged period, compounded by the summer's heat, contributed to the advanced decomposition of the remains, complicating the assessment of their injuries and hindering efforts to detect any signs of sexual assault or obtain forensic evidence. Notably, this crime occurred in 1968, a time when forensic science had not yet advanced to its current state lacking many of the technological and methodological tools available today. In a course of several autopsies conducted over the years, various reports and descriptions regarding the positions of the victims' bodies within the cabin emerged. Shirley, aged 40, was discovered lying on her stomach in the southeast section of the living room, her form concealed beneath a plaid blanket except for the area below her knees. 
she had suffered a single gunshot wound to the head with a 25 caliber projectile identified during the initial autopsy. Shirley's body appeared to have been intentionally arranged in a manner suggestive of a sexually motivated crime. Richard, aged 42, was found in the hallway, positioned over the hot air register. He sustained a single gunshot wound to the head with a 25 caliber slug recovered during the first autopsy. Additionally, he exhibited skull fractures and signs of blunt force trauma. A subsequent autopsy revealed a 22 caliber projectile, suggesting he was initially shot in the chest with a 22 caliber rifle and later in the head with a pistol. Richie, the 19-year-old student at Eastern Michigan University, was located in the northwest bedroom with part of his body extending into the hallway. He had sustained multiple gunshot wounds to the head, all attributable to 25 caliber projectiles. Gary, aged 16 and a student at Southfield Lathrop High School, was found on his back along the east wall of the northwest bedroom. He had two gunshot wounds to the head, both linked to 25 caliber slugs. A second autopsy revealed a 22 caliber slug and evidence of a back injury. Randall, aged 12, was found atop his father, positioned on a lavender colored rug with a cause of death attributed to a gunshot wound to the head, although no bullet was recovered during the autopsy. Susan, aged seven, was discovered lying on her back in the hallway adjacent to her father's body. She had sustained a gunshot wound to the face and a 25 caliber slug was retrieved from her clothing. Additionally, she exhibited a skull fracture, possibly resulting from a claw hammer found at the scene. Initially, the authorities were confounded by the lack of a clear motive for the heinous murders. The acquaintances of the Robeson family, who were known for their regular church attendance, absence of enemies, and affectionate family dynamic, provided no apparent motive for the heinous acts the Robeson children were described as well-mannered and academically successful. The question lingered, why would anyone perpetrate such a violently brutal act, only to leave their bodies to decompose over several weeks? The first imperative for the police was to delve into any conceivable reasons why the Robeson family might have been singled out, as well as explore potential grudges held by individuals connected to them. Notably, law enforcement leaned towards the belief that the primary target was Richard Robeson, the family's patriarch. This raised a perplexing query. If Richard was the intended victim, what could drive the assailant to extend their violence to the entire family, resulting in six deaths, including four children? As part of their investigative efforts, authorities scrutinized Richard Robeson's business affairs detectives harbored a suspicion that the murders might be entangled with his professional life. Richard, who owned a magazine called Impresario, maintained numerous professional interactions. Despite his outwardly prosperous image, it was uncovered that his business enterprises were mired in financial difficulties. Allegations of questionable practices within his advertising business potentially serving his interests at the expense of his clients, along with rumors of extramarital affairs and inappropriate relationships with secretaries in his company, were also brought to light. The inquiry led authorities to believe that Richard might have been involved in undisclosed, potentially contentious dealings that could have antagonized his clientele. Investigators subsequently unearthed that Robertson had often engaged in a deceptive scheme over a span of three years, he duped clients, extracting as much as $50,000 from them by invoicing for advertisements that he either failed to run or neglected to remunerate, although he had alluded to ongoing deals with colleagues and family members. The specifics remained shrouded in mystery. Additionally, he had unauthorizedly published full-page airline advertisements in his own magazine, creating the illusion of greater success than reality warranted. The nature of these advertisements revealed Robeson's perspective as he envisioned Impresario as a marketing instrument for his ambitious endeavor. A global network of large computerized warehouses situated at airports, each housing a cultural center reachable by air travel. Robeson's objective was to secure $100 million in investments from a group known as the Superior Table. He portrayed the table as a worldwide organization dedicated to achieving complete peace and unity among all countries on Earth, 
At its helm was an enigmatic figure named Robert, who presided over fellow investors with monikers like Mr. Thomas and Mr. Peters. The mysterious references to Robert included a St. Christopher Medal Robeson war inscribed with the words, Richard, to my chosen son and heir. God bless you, Robert. The question looms, was Robert the same as the Mr. Roberts expected on the night of the murders? If so, this individual never materialized at the Pelston airport or inquired about the family afterward. Detectives uncovered that Robertson had spent three days at the Metro Airport Hotel just before the family's departure for Good Heart, a scenario that had repeated itself on previous occasions when he had secretly checked into airport hotels while informing his family that he was on a business trip. Scolaro, who claimed to possess minimal insight into Robertson's secretive activities, suggested that the hotel served as a hub for the new enterprise. Nonetheless, Robison seemed to have remained confined to his room without receiving any visitors or making any unusual phone calls. The connection, if any, between these covert actions and the murders remains shrouded in mystery. Were Roba and the other members of the superior table genuine, or were they part of an elaborate illusion? To this day, the answers to these questions remain elusive. Additionally, there were indications of a possible history of mental health issues, although the veracity of such claims remained uncertain. This multifaceted profile suggested that Richard might be a more complex individual than initially perceived, with his behavior potentially serving as the catalyst for someone to perpetrate the horrifying act of annihilating his entire family. The murderer demonstrated a capacity for personalized, one-on-one -on -one violence, deploying both firearms and a hammer to inflict fatal harm on the family. One significant revelation pertained to Richard's time at Goodhart, where he entrusted his business to Joseph Scolaro, a 30-year-old employee who was found to have embezzled approximately $60,000 equivalent to $140,358 today. Suspicion arose due to a series of phone calls between Robison and Scolaro on the morning of the murders. The police constructed a theory suggesting that during this fateful phone call, Richard confronted Joseph about the embezzlement. In response, an alarmed Joseph hastily left Detroit, embarking on a multi-hour drive to Good Heart. It's believed he took this drastic action and tragically ended the lives of the Robeson family before Richard could expose Joseph's transgressions. Circumstantial evidence lends weight to this theory. Joseph remained out of contact with friends, business associates, and family for a 12-hour stretch on the day of the murders, with no corroborating alibis to support his whereabouts. Joseph claimed to have attended a plumbing convention and interacted with clients, yet no one could confirm his presence or vouch for his claims. Nevertheless, lingering uncertainties persist. The journey from Detroit to Goodhart typically spans between five to six hours, Gunshots were reported around 9 p.m. on the fateful day of the murders. Curiously, Scolaro's wife provided an alibi, asserting his presence at home in Birmingham around 11 p.m. that evening, introducing a perplexing inconsistency. As they delved deeper into the case, discrepancies between the evidence and Scolaro's statements became increasingly apparent to the investigators. Specifically, their scrutiny turned towards Scolaro's alibi in connection to the time of the homicides. According to Scolaro's initial account to the authorities, his last conversation with his employer, Robison, took place during a phone call on June 25, 1968, during which Robison inquired about the arrival of certain company checks at the Southfield office. Subsequently, investigators developed suspicions that Scolaro had recently orchestrated a substantial increase in his own salary and expanded his expense account, along with awarding pay raises to fellow employees, all without Robeson's awareness. This suspicion was substantiated by the examination of pre-signed checks, which revealed that Scolaro had been consistently filling out larger-than-usual amounts in the weeks leading up to the tragic events. At the crime scene, law enforcement discovered shell casings and blood-soaked footprints, which strongly suggested the presence of the perpetrator. In the possession of Joe Scolaro, they found a pristine pair of shoes that perfectly matched the distinctive shoe prints left behind. However, these shoes remained untarnished, indicating they had never been worn. This posed a challenge for the police, 
as the shoe match didn't unequivocally implicate Joe Scolaro as the person at the cabin during the murders. Further probing revealed that although Scolaro had a new pair of shoes, he had a known tendency to acquire duplicates of the same items, leading investigators to speculate that the other pair might have been used during the Robeson murders. Adding to suspicion, Joseph failed two polygraph tests and received inconclusive results on a third. Following the gruesome Robeson murders, Scolaro assumed ownership of the business. In 1968, after undergoing his final polygraph examination, the polygraph expert on the case, Edward Goss, bluntly addressed the underlying truth with Scolaro. Goss recalled saying, Joe, we both know you're guilty of this thing. In response, Scolaro displayed a knowing grin, abruptly rose from his seat and exited the examination room, offering no further response. Another significant lead in the investigation involved a firearm registered to Joe Scolaro, which exhibited certain similarities to the suspected murder weapon, although it was not an exact match. The two key firearms central to the case were a 25 caliber Beretta automatic pistol and a rare 22 caliber Armalite AR-7 rifle. Police records revealed Scolaro's ownership of two of each, accompanied by his assertion that he had given one pistol to Robeson and donated both rifles. However, a pivotal moment occurred in 1969 when witness testimonies guided law enforcement to a private shooting range owned by Scolaro's father-in-law, a place frequently visited by Scolaro due to his background as a former military marksman. During their investigation at this location, detectives made a compelling discovery, AR-7 shell casings that precisely matched those recovered at the crime scene. This crucial breakthrough was confirmed by a report from the State Police Laboratory, finally providing conclusive evidence. As a result, these circumstances led law enforcement to identify him as a prime suspect in the case. In December 1969, over a year following the murder of the Robeson family, investigators approached the county's prosecutor with their case against Joseph Scolaro, hoping to bring charges against him for the crimes. Unfortunately, Due to the absence of murder weapons and eyewitnesses, the prosecutor regrettably declined to proceed. The evidence provided was deemed purely circumstantial and failed to offer conclusive proof of Scolaro's guilt, resulting in the case going cold. Nevertheless, the tenacious detectives refused to relinquish their pursuit of justice. They continued to collaborate with prosecutors in both Emmett County, where the crime occurred, and Oakland County, where the Robeson family resided, to persist with the investigation. Four years later, in 1973, a newly elected prosecutor, Lewis Brooks Patterson, revisited the Robeson case and is now willing to bring charges against Scolaro for conspiracy to commit murder. On March 8, 1973, Two individuals entered Scolaro's office with the intention of collecting a debt amounting to $730. To their shock, they found Scolaro lifeless in his chair. A Beretta gunshot had pierced through his skull, sending a framed glass picture on the wall into disarray. Police were immediately summoned to Scolaro's office building, where they encountered his lifeless body. Scolaro, unable to successfully manage the business, had taken his own life by a self-inflicted gunshot wound abruptly putting an end to Brooks' pursuit of prosecution. On his desk lay a note that read, Mother, where do I start? I am a liar, cheat, phony. Any check that any of the people have with your signature isn't any good because I forged your name to it to get them off my back. I know I'm sick, but seeking help isn't going to help the people I've hurt. He added a postscript. I had nothing to do with the Robesons. I'm a cheat, but not a murderer. Despite this, Many observers of the case, as well as the state police and the Emmett County Sheriff's Department, still consider him the primary suspect. No charges were ever pressed against him, and with his demise, the opportunity to extract any truth from him was irrevocably lost. The enigma deepened as it came to light that on the night of his tragic end, an anonymous caller reached out to Edward Goss. However, it was Goss's high school-aged son who picked up the phone at their home, and the mysterious caller conveyed a simple message. Just tell him Joe called and that he was right. Goss perceived this message as a reaction to something he had previously told Scolaro. You're a good Catholic boy. It's going to eat at you until you confess. Scolaro is not the sole individual implicated in the killing of Richard Robeson and his family. 
Critics challenging the Scolaro as the killer theory argue that it would have been virtually impossible for Scolaro to drive to Goodhart, carry out the murders, and return to the Detroit area within the time frame for which he lacked an alibi. Another name associated with these murders is John Norman Collins, a man associated with a string of homicides between 1967 and 1969 in southeastern Michigan, targeting teenage girls who were abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered. Although he was convicted of one murder in 1970, he's suspected of being the infamous Michigan murderer. Collins was considered a potential suspect in the Robeson family case due to his connection with Ritchie, the family's eldest son. Both attended the same university in eastern Michigan, though no clear motive has ever been established for Collins to commit these murders, which don't align with his usual modus operandi. As a result, many dismiss him as a credible suspect, there are also suggestions about the possible involvement of Blisswood's caretaker, Chauncey Bliss, who discovered the Robeson family's bodies. Bliss, known for his eccentric nature, was well acquainted with the cabin and its surroundings due to his role in constructing it. Some local residents in Goodhart speculate that he might have committed the murders after his son, a friend of the Robeson boys, tragically died in a motorcycle accident shortly before the family's murder. According to this theory, Bliss, feeling wronged by Richard Robeson in the aftermath of his son's death, sought revenge by killing the family. While a revenge killing arising from grief is conceivable, it seems implausible given the circumstances. Importantly, it's worth noting that Chauncey Bliss has never been considered a suspect by law enforcement. Other suspects have been proposed and ruled out, leaving the case officially unsolved. Nearly five decades later, Goodhart remains a serene vacation destination for those seeking an escape. Unfortunately, for the family, their pursuit of tranquility abruptly ended during a violent encounter from which they never returned. However, there are alternative investigative avenues that investigators are inclined to pursue. One of Robeson's former secretaries eventually married a wealthy and influential manufacturing magnate with rumored ties to organized crime in Cleveland, Around the time of the murders, this woman experienced a miscarriage and speculation arose that the child may have been Robeson's rather than her 70-year-old husband's. Additionally, the family associated with one of the companies swindled by Robeson was thought to have connections to the mob. Could envy or financial misconduct have triggered violent retaliation? Mardi Link, the author of When Evil Came to Good Heart, suggests that the notion of an underworld connection certainly has some validity. Notably, the AR-7 firearm used in the murders was considered a novelty weapon, preferred by mafia contract killers during that era. In 1968, there were press reports of an informant claiming that Robeson owed the mob a substantial sum, approximately $12,000 monthly, and was significantly behind on his payments. The informant cited a colleague who remarked, if he hadn't withheld payments like he did, we wouldn't have wiped out the entire family. After Scolaro's demise, the case seemed to hit a standstill. Then, in February 1974, a state trooper from the Romeo Post conducted a routine search of a blue 1965 Chevrolet with Ohio license plates that had been abandoned by the side of the M14 highway. Inside the glove box, a luggage tag was discovered bearing the inscription, Shirley L. Robeson, 18790 Dolores, Lathrop Village, Michigan. The presence of such an item in an abandoned car, six years after the murders and 200 miles, 322 kilometers, from the crime scene raised numerous questions. Detectives thoroughly examined the vehicle for any clues but found nothing of significance. A title search revealed that the car had been purchased new from a Toledo dealership in 1966. Between its initial purchase and its abandonment several years later, it had passed through various owners, both legally and illicitly. All registered owners were located, yet none had any recollection of the luggage tag or any knowledge of how it ended up there. The deserted Chevy and the enigmatic luggage tag added yet another perplexing dead end to the investigation. Over the years, there have been lingering questions regarding the lack of charges brought against the main suspect by Emmett County Prosecutor Donald Noggle. Some have made allegations suggesting that the county was hesitant to bear the financial burden of an expensive trial, while others have raised concerns about Noggle's courtroom experience and his ability to secure a conviction. 
Former Emmett County Prosecutor Richard Smith, who held his position at the time of the murder, shared his perspective, stating, I think, number one, the county wasn't interested in the cost. I think they could have afforded it, but they weren't interested in the costs. And then when Oakland County determined they could bring murder charges there, I think that relieved a lot of people in Emmett County that they would not have the cost, the expense, and the publicity of a trial taking place here. I think the prosecutor who replaced me had plenty of experience. 45 years after the crimes unfolded, Detective Sergeant Jim Lindemann, Sumpter of the Emmett County Sheriff's Office, became the latest investigator to take charge of the case. He explained that their department follows a procedure where the next detective automatically assumes responsibility for an ongoing case as their predecessor retires. Sumpter also emphasized that a significant portion of his evidence room was dedicated to items connected to what he referred to as the most critical unsolved case in the county. He further added, as a department, we hope it ends every day. We hope that there is a true conclusion. Five years hence, on the solemn occasion of the 50th anniversary, retired investigators collaborated with a local historian and author to organize a community forum focused on the case. During their presentation, they disclosed that there was no mystery surrounding the Robeson family murders. They asserted that the primary suspect identified by the police was indeed the sole legitimate suspect, a man who took his own life as the authorities were preparing to arrest him on six counts of murder in 1973. As we stand here at the crossroads of a chilling and perplexing case, the Robeson family's tragic story serves as a stark reminder of the enduring mysteries that haunt the annals of unsolved family murders. In that idyllic summer of 1968, a family of six embarked on a journey to their beloved cabin in Goodhart, Michigan, anticipating a season of warmth and togetherness. What should have been a time of joy and cherished memories was abruptly transformed into a harrowing tale of terror. The horrifying events that unfolded within the confines of that remote cabin were hidden from the world for an agonizing month, leaving countless questions unanswered. The investigation led law enforcement down several paths, but one name emerged as the prime suspect, Joseph Scolaro. The case against him was built upon circumstantial evidence, including discrepancies in his business dealings with Richard Robeson. Scolaro's sudden death cut short any hopes of a trial leaving a trail of lingering doubts. Many theories, alternative suspects, and questions have swirled around this case over the years. Some have cast doubt on the official narrative, while others have suggested connections to the mob and organized crime. The presence of an abandoned car bearing Shirley Robeson's luggage tag miles away from the crime scene added another layer of intrigue. Despite the dedicated efforts of law enforcement and a host of investigators, the Robeson family murders remain an enigma. Over the decades, as the case gathered dust in evidence rooms and in the collective memory, one truth has endured. The perpetrator has, to this day, eluded the grasp of justice, evading accountability for the heinous act they committed, and leaving an unresolved void in the hearts of those who lost six family members in a nightmarish ordeal. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any true crimes or unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, stay safe out there. Until next time.